everybody. Today I have Adam Fleming with me to, here to talk about his newest book, Satchel Pong and the Great Migration. This is book one of the Satchel Pong Chronicles, so we will have more books to come in this series. So welcome, Adam. And why don't you tell us a bit about this story and the world you've created for it? Great. Okay. And here's the book right here. Actually, this is a galley proof, so that's the first one ever. Um, more coming up soon. So Satchel Pong is a story about, um, it's kind of a steampunk uh, set in a fantasy world. Um, and my wife commented recently, you know, steampunk is usually like dark, gritty, like city stuff. This has a lot of, it's a great migration, right? So it has a lot of traveling through a fantasy world that in, in places that aren't necessarily in a city. But the, the, the whole idea is Satchel Pong is a meteorologist who has finally figured out that his world is heating up too much. And he's got to move his people. He's got, to he's got to convince his people to leave their island home and go somewhere else. So um, that's what it's basically about. What inspired this book? Now that's a really fun question because I'm writing this whole other book. It's got 250,000 words in it, which is like three books. So it's probably going to be a three or four book series about it's not a fantasy book. It's set in the real world with a guy who leads a rock band, um, a drummer. And my whole idea there was they ought to have some weird book that they read and then start um, writing concept albums from this weird book. So I think four or five years ago, I started writing Satchel Pong um, not necessarily intending to publish it, um, just to give some background to the other story. And, um, and then a couple of years went by and I pulled the manuscript up again and realized Satchel Pong and the Great Migration is 85% done and it's pretty good. I should this too. So once I got done with that, then, uh, you know, it just, it steamrolled into, okay, the story didn't really end here, so I need book two. And um, right now I'm drafting book four, and I think there's going to be five or six. So nice. uh, there's, there's uh, one, the second one is available as an ebook currently, and we'll be working on the, um, you, you got to have a back cover. So I've, I've got to do the back cover so that I can get uh, number two in paper. Sure. sure. Talk a bit about Satchel Pong and um, some of the other main characters that play a role in this like, what makes them tick? Why are they who they are? Satchel Pong is, so he's like an elected official, but he's a, he's a meteorologist. So his, his role in the government is to is track, like, the science of, of the weather. And he's supposed to give annual reports, and he's kind of been neglecting his duty and starts to get called out on this by see him walking down the street hey you're supposed to give a, a weather report and you haven't done it and he hasn't been doing it because he's afraid you know um and it's going to require some level of leadership that he's kind of afraid to take um to really because the results of the last 10 years are not um uh, not good it's not a good prognosis so something needs to be done but he's he's not enough of a leader to kind of take the leadership required um so it's it's kind of a journey. It's kind of a leadership journey in a sense, and I would not say it's an um, it's not a leadership book. It's not an analogy. It's not one of those like um, thinly disguised leadership books posing as a novel. It's definitely a novel. But Satchel Pong is in the, on this kind of hesitant, reluctant leadership um, of of his people because he is an elected official. He does have like an official responsibility that he's sort of been shirking. Um, and another fun character here is the um, wireless apprentice whose name is Antoinette Jo. And her, her job, she's been learning how to build a wireless set. And um, her, her mentor or master is a really old guy. Um, and he's talking with the dirigibles. And so they're getting some outside information from the outer world through through radio basically and she's a radio operator so she becomes satchel pong's right hand woman on the journey of leading people um away from their islands so 
they're two a couple interesting people. Which character in the book was the most challenging to create? I mean, I think the challenge, the most challenging thing is uh, consistency. Sometimes I add characters in just to create, uh, um, create an ensemble. And then as the ensemble continues to travel together, that cr character takes on more and more personality. It's almost like if somebody joins your friend group and you don't know them very well yet, and then they just kind of hang around and hang around. And the longer they hang around, the more you get to know them until all of a sudden they've got the next book named after them, you know, or they're the main character, you know? Uh, so, so I think that's the challenge for me is like, sometimes I fold people in and I go, okay, here's a person and they just join the group and, um, Hmm, who are they? What, are, what, I don't know what makes them tick yet. And we'll discover that as we go. And, and I think there's kind of a fun discovery process for the reader too, um, that you kind of, you would feel that I think like, I don't know who this person is yet. Um, and then you just get to know them as the story continues. What did you have to edit out of the book? And was there anything you were really disappointed that you had to, but you needed to, to keep the flow of the book? Uh, you know, the funny thing is, as I was talking about this other book series, the whole idea was that this book was written by some weird, um, kind of reclusive, almost hermit, uh, backwoods Indiana performance artist. And, and the idea was that, which is kind of like me, except I'm not really a reclusive hermit, but I'm a weird Indiana performance artist, maybe. That might be closer to the truth. But the idea was that right smack dab in the middle of Satchel Pong, he just stops and writes this long political diatribe that has nothing to do with Satchel Pong. And um, when I realized that I wanted to, to like publish it as a book, I decided I had to pull that out of the middle because it would just be so jarring. And that was the yeah. point, like, it would be super jarring. And then all of a sudden he's done and just like Satapong just continues. But what I did um, for the paperback version was I pulled it and, and stuck it in the back. So it, it's kind of like the piece that goes along with the, the bigger um, project set in the real world, so. Who are some of your favorite authors? Um, I like to read, so I like to read heavy stuff because it challenges me. Um, I think, you know, um, for example, like Stephen King says, when you're young, read anything, let your kids read comic books, let them read whatever garbage they want mm -hmm. that you think is, is maybe not, not particularly um, literary, just so that they're reading. Um, but he, he talks about when there's a certain point when he's a teenager and he's reading something and he's going, wait, I can write better than this. And so when you get to the point where you think I could do better than that, then you have to look for, for literature that um, challenges you. So the most recent book that I bought, which I bought at Fables, I just finished reading it a couple days ago, is called The Mysterious Flame of Queen Luana and it's by Umberto Eco. So it's a, uh, you know, it's kind of like heavy literature, but I like to read Barbara Kingsolver, John Irving. I like to read um, Garrison Keillor has been one of my favorites because I, I think of myself as a humorist. So my books are, they may be an adventure in a, in a fantasy world, but they're fun. I mean, they're funny, they're not dark. Um, so I like to read humorist stuff. I love Mark Twain. Uh, I think everybody should read Huckleberry Finn at least once. I did. Um, so I know you have other books out and we carry many, most of them. Um, tell us a bit about your other work. Okay, sure. Um, the first one I did is called White Buffalo Gold. Um, published this in 2012. Uh, this is a real world story about a, about a um, small town in Nebraska where um, the school is consolidating into, you know, as small towns do, sometimes the school gets kind of, there's not enough kids. And so then they consolidate with a lot, a uh, wider area. And then it just feels like it's dying. And there's five people in this graduating class that it follows and like, what are they doing with their lives? Um, my editor on this project um, is Dan Shank. He's a local editor who's really, were super professional. And he said, Adam, what are you trying to do? Write the great American novel. And I said, why would I try to do anything else? So 
this is my first attempt at the Great American Novel, White Buffalo Gold. So there's that. Um, I do not actually, all the remaining copies that I have right now of Stetson Jeff are at Fables. Uh, the Stetson Jeff Adventures I've written with, co-written with Justin Fike, who lives in Colorado. Um, Justin is a super, um, super good at understanding story structure. He has a master's degree from Oxford University in creative writing, and he's really sharp. So we wrote this, uh, so far we have three books out about Stetson Jeff. He's uh, kind of think a cross between Walker, Texas Ranger and Forrest Gump. Um, he travels the world in search of justice and a good stake. So he's kind of a Texan cowboy who ends up in Thailand and Morocco and Amish country, Pennsylvania. So um, that's fun. And then, you know, as a leadership coach, I've written some nonfiction as well. And the one you could find at Fables is called The Art of Motivational Listening. Um, this has a bunch of tags in it because it was the galley proof and I never took them out. But The Art of Motivational Listening, um, Creative Ideas for Effective Leaders. This is like a series of almost like a series of blog posts. So it's a nonlinear look at how to listen and how to coach. Um, there's a lot of linear books on how to coach. This is more like a series of fun essays from my career as a coach. So that's what I've got to talk about today. What led you to start writing? You now have several books under your belt. Why did you start writing books? Yeah, um, I, I tinkered around with stone sculpture. I've always known that I want to do something in the arts that I've got to keep using my creative, honing my creative chops. Um, Partly, I think, sort of in the recession of 2009, I started realizing that carving stone is super expensive and I didn't have the money for more materials. Um, and it's, it, it's also kind of an art form where you've got to have high-end buyers to keep moving product out. And so um, I realized too that life only has, I only have time really to, to master one discipline long-term. Uh, and I was reading about Michelangelo and how he started um, carving marble when he was like, I don't know, five or 10, maybe 10, really young. Um, and, and, you know, the first thing that they had Michelangelo do for probably a couple of years was just cut paving stones or, you know, like he was not, he was not doing anything fancy, but he was just learning how to cut through marble um, without breaking a chunk off or whatever. And I realized I did not start young enough. <laughs> with sculpture to become a master sculptor. But I did start reading and writing um, when I was very young. And uh, so I think it was, you know, sometime around 2010, 2009 that I started working, um, working on books. I was also having back problems. So the physicality of doing stone sculpture was, was challenging for me for a while. And, um, so it was just like, well, this is the thing that I've really done since I was really young. Um, and it's, a, it's the art form that I really understand. Do you have any uh, advice for older writers who are maybe coming into or wanting to start writing at, at an older, like as in their adult years? Um, yeah, I, I do. Um, I think, I guess my first, novel I published in my late 30s and I realized that I, there's a there's a writer named James Missioner I've read a ton of his work um, not every book but quite probably probably 75 percent of them and he he wrote historical fiction and he published his first one which was South Pacific and was made into a Rodgers and Hammerstein musical um, and that kickstarted his career he he published that when he was 40 and went on to write, I think, a, a little more than one book a year until he was in his early 90s. So I think his his total total output is somewhere between 50 and 60 books. And they're like four inches thick, all of them. So there's a lot you can do as an older writer. Don't feel like you have to um, make up for lost time. Like, that your first 40 years on this planet are not lost time. They're all your experience. You have to have that before you can really um, 
you know, put something into a good book. So I, I think it's very rare for someone to write a truly great book under the age of 30. I just don't, I, I'm not saying it's impossible. It has been done, but those are extremely rare and um, um, fantastically gifted people. And you're probably not. So relax. Like, so you're not maybe a fantastically gifted people who wrote something, you know, but a lot of those writers in the 1800s, they also died when they were 42. So, you know, like if you didn't get it done before 30, you're going to be dead. So hopefully you have a good 70 years on this planet and 30 years of it, you can do your writing or whatever, just go do it. Um, and don't get bogged down in like thinking that uh, it ha your first one has to be perfect or whatever. What is the most difficult part of uh, your writing process? Um, I don't know. Um, right now, everything feels really easy. <laughs> so <laughs> I think uh, maybe one of the most difficult parts is the editing. Um, I would say. But right now, I'm not in editing mode. So that doesn't feel heavy on me right now. <laughs> Well, tell us a bit about your writing process when you're not in editing, in the creative process. Um, I just try to keep moving, you know, one foot in front of the other um, and not worry about whether the last chapter was perfect or even something I can keep. Um, realizing that maybe I've revealed something, um, you know, maybe I just wrote the ending essentially <laughs> in the third chapter and um, just say, okay, well, we're just going to leave that right where it is. I'm not going to go back and try to mess around with it. I'm just going to try maybe the, maybe the next chapter to even assume that that last chapter didn't happen and see what happens. So I think a lot of times um, it's just really about trying to get that. Um, the last two months I've been averaging about 1300 words a day, usually in about, usually in about an hour. So just trying to get that time in and just keep moving with the story and, and see where it goes. Do you have any uh, support people, critique partners, writing groups, ed your editor, um, agent, anybody else who you rely on and what roles do they play? I, I rely pretty heavily on my wife. I, I know a lot of authors say you should just write the first draft and not show it to anybody until the first draft is done. But um, I know in the movies, in the movie industry, oftentimes a director will sit at the end of the day with a small team and read uh, or and watch through all the film footage that they shot that day. It's called doing, um, watching the dailies. And I like to do that with my wife. I'll just, I'll have, you know, it might only be five or 10 paragraphs. So it only takes a couple minutes in the evening before we go to bed and I'll have her sit and read it. And then she'll make editorial comments and I'll, and I'll say, we're not editing yet, so don't bother me with that. <laughs> but I think she is also going to become my editor in the near future too. So I just have to find a way to pay her. <laughs> <laughs> that would be helpful. Yes. Um, what technologies do you rely on the most? Um, yeah, for, for writing, uh, one of the programs that um, we like to use a lot is called Scrivener. And um, it's not a free download, but it's not a super expensive program, and I'm getting more adept with it, and um, it's saved. So, like, if you've ever lost stuff on a Word document, that sucks. <laughs> so, if there's no other reason, then you don't have to remember to save stuff. Scrivener is a great tool, and it publishes to Kindle Direct Publishing super, super easily. So, um, it makes it pretty, pretty seamless to get your book from, you know, something you're typing to this. Wonderful. What is the worst writing or publishing advice you ever got? Um, I think the worst advice is to, to, and this is just me personally. And for some people it works like my co-author, Justin, is like you have to fit a niche so that Amazon knows what to, how to categorize you, um, which is true from a marketing perspective, but it's for me, it's not true to myself. Um, so I think the best advice is be true to yourself 
and the worst advice could be for some people to uh, put so much effort into trying to hit a niche. Um, like it's got to be, you know, vampires. Mm -hmm. I have an interesting idea to do vampires, but in spaceships, you know, and so like crossing over genres might be really unadvisable from a marketing perspective, but it could be really good to be true to myself. So what's your favorite unappreciated novel? I have it right here. I actually have some, uh, copies on consignment at Fables Bookshop because this book is so important to me um, that I started buying them up, like used copies on the internet. It's called Jonas and Sally. It's by an author named Rich Foss. He's deceased. He was kind of my inspiration for writing. He was, uh, he was um, someone at the church I grew up in. He was like an elder and when I read this and saw how beautiful it was, what a beautiful story he had done, I, I thought maybe I could do that too, um, write a beautiful story like that. This is kind of in the, it, it's kind of in the genre of Christian fiction, um, but it's, it's about an incestuous, uh, abusive relationship. So it is not light reading. Um, it, it's, it's pretty heavy, but it is just beautiful. It's poetic. Um, and it's about redemption, and it's about love. It's a love story. Um, and so, uh, yeah, Jonas and Sally, what a great book by Rich Foss. Yes. Is there any other projects that you haven't told us about that you're working on? Um, Justin Fike and I are working on some uh, a fantasy novel that's, uh, it's called Urban Fantasy, so it's like, it's set in World War II, but magic is starting to happen again and, and and it's set in England in World War II. So, you know, you've got to have Merlin in there. And um, so Mer think Merlin in London in World War II, um, we're doing something like that. So that's, that's a series that we'll be coming out with and then um, other projects. I think I've told you about most of my projects. All right, my final question is, what do you hope your readers will take away from this newest book, um, Satchel Pong and the Great Migration? Um, I hope that they will take away enough interest that they'll want to buy Satchel Pong and the Search for Emil Ennis <laughs> and, and so forth. Um, so I guess the takeaway is like, oh, this isn't over yet. I got to know what's next. <laughs> I think that's, you know, there's not a specific learning, but I, I hope that people, you know, um, just go, this is intriguing. And I want to know, I want to know what's going on in the next book. So I couldn't hope for anything more than that. Wonderful. Well, yeah. thank you, Adam, again, for uh, interviewing with me today and telling us about your books and your work. We appreciate it's it. It's a huge, huge honor, Kristen. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah.